I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today's topic will be graphs, function graphs. Well, first of all, let's very briefly remind what the function actually is. If you remember, function contains the definition of function includes uh, the set which is called domain, another set which is called codomain. and certain rule which puts into correspondence every element of the domain to a corresponding element, a value uh, of codomain. When we are talking about graphs, we are talking about one particular um, kind of functions. Functions when both domain and codomain are real numbers. And um, here is why. Um, graph is something which is supposed to represent on the surface, on the plane, uh, the behavior of the function. Um, usually graphs are used for um, studying qualitative behavior on the function, much rarer quantitative. Now we have computers, they can calculate everything much more precisely, which we can graph. However, it's always very interesting to research how the graph behaves because it represents the functional behavior. So. Um, why planes and why real numbers? Well, for a very uh, simple reason. On the plane, we can very easily um, construct um, a graphical representation of a function which has domain and codomain real numbers. And here is how. Imagine you have two perpendicular straight lines on the plane. Plane, in this case, this is the board. Now, <coughs> um, I will associate this horizontal line with um, real numbers, and you know that um, uh, points uh, on, uh, on, a plane, on, on a line correspond to real numbers quite, quite easily. So I will um, associate every point on this line with a uh, domain of real numbers uh, for the function which has this type of a domain. And the crossing of these two lines I will associate with the number zero. Um, and then let's assume we have certain unit segment um, which represents the number one. So using this unit segment I can basically mark uh, points which correspond to every integer number on this line. And obviously um, Everything in between is also can be defined. Now, as I said, the horizontal line represents the main real numbers, arguments of our function. Now, the vertical line will represent the values, the codomain um, of the function. And I can use the same um, unit segment to basically uh, associate every point with first integer numbers and then fractions in between, irrational, whatever. Um, so basically, right now, I have a representation of domain and codomain uh, on the plane using my two coordinate um, lines. This line is called x-axis. And this line, the vertical, is called y-axis. A different name is abscissa and ordinate. All right, now, so I have represented domain and codomain of the function. Now, how do I represent the function? Because the function is basically not only domain and codomain, but most importantly, <coughs> it's a correspondence between the elements of the domain and uh, corresponding elements of the codomain, the values. So, if I know that every point um, in the domain on the x-axis represents an element of the domain and it means that it should have a corresponding representation in the codomain. Well, let's do this. For instance, I'm looking for a, a representation, an image, a, a value of the function if my argument is equal to this particular real number. Well, very easy. Let's say the function tells 
that the corresponding number is whatever, this for instance. So, I can always put two perpendicular lines, and on the crossing I have a point. So, this point represents that this particular number corresponds to this particular number in the function, in, in the value of the function. So, the value of this argument is this. So, every point on the plane represents a pair of argument and function. Okay, fine. Now, if I have a function which uh, has, let's say, all the real numbers as its domain, let's say the function can, fun can, can be uh, algebraically expressed as uh, y is equal to 3x plus 1. Well, um, well, obviously, if I will put for every point on the plane, if I will uh, put a corresponding point on the on the plane which really represents the functional dependency. Let's say x is equal to zero, y is equal to one, which means the argument is zero and uh, the functional value is one. So it's this point with coordinates zero one. It belongs to our function, right? This function represents the value. Uh, of the function, this point represents the value of the function if argument is equal to zero. Now, if argument is equal to one, let's say, then it will be four, right? So this is one, four is somewhere over there. So this is another function. If argument is equal to minus one, that will be what? Minus three plus one minus two. Okay, so minus one, minus two. This is another point. Argument is equal to minus one, value is equal to minus 2. So we have minus 1, minus 2, etc. I can put many different points, and in this particular case, um, this uh, graph will look something like this. Now, um, we can definitely prove that something like a polynomial of the first degree is a straight line on the graph or polynomial of the second degree, something like would be a parabola, looks like this. So there are many different things which you can uh, do with graphs, but I would like to concentrate more on uh, qualitative characteristics of the graph. And here is what's uh, very important when you're dealing with graphs. First of all, we have to really very clearly identify the function domain. If you will take a function which looks like this, what's the domain of this function? Well, obviously, zero is not among the arguments of this function because you cannot divide by zero. So in this case, um, arguments can be any number on this line except this point zero. So that should be clearly identified. There are many ways to, to basically show on the graph that this particular point or this particular segment is not really included in the domain. In this particular case, you can either use a couple of arrows in this case or make a little circle or whatever. It doesn't really matter. There are many ways. But it should be somehow identified. These two ways, using little errors and, and the circle, are more traditional. But it's not the matter. What matter is that you should identify, at least for yourself, that it's uh, not every real number which can be um, uh, can be a domain can in, can be included in the domain of this function. But some of them really are not there at all. Function is not defined. So these are kind of special. Uh, points or segments, usually it's points, um, when you're dealing with graphs. And these special points, which are not included in the domain, usually have their peculiarities. Um, now, what kind of peculiarities we might expect from these special points? <coughs> well, um, in, this particular in this particular case, for instance, you know that if x is getting 
let's say x is uh, uh, some positive number, but if x is diminishing, let's say first x is equal to 1, then 1 half, then 1 quarter, then 1 eighth, it's something, etc., etc., et then its reverse will be increasing. As x goes down to 0, to this special point, the value of the function will be bigger and bigger, and as you probably understand, it will be infinitely big. So whenever we approach zero from the right, from the positive uh, side of the argument, the value will, um, will be greater and greater, so the graph will go to infinity. Similarly, if x is negative, and also approaches zero from this side, from left to right. Same thing would happen, but in this case, infinity would be a negative. So it would be something like this. So this qualitative property of the graph, that when you are approaching a special point where graph is not, function is not really defined, and, and graph neither, then the graph behaves this particular way. That's what's very important. Now, special points, that's number one. Secondly, what's very important is how graph behaves uh, when uh, the argument goes to infinity. Now, in this particular case, we probably can make exactly the same type of um, logical conclusion. If x is increasing, obviously the reverse is decreasing, down to zero, basically. So function will probably be something like this. It will be smaller and smaller and smaller and as our arguments are getting bigger and bigger. Same thing would be in the negative direction if I go to minus infinity on the x, uh, on the argument side, then the function will also diminish in its absolute value, but staying negative. So it will be under this x-axis and approaching it. All right, so that's how um, we have to really pay attention to where exactly our arguments are. Special points and infinity. Now, how are the function behaves? Well, as we have just seen, uh, around special points, functions should be really um, investigated very thoroughly about how it behaves. And uh, same thing on, uh, on the infinity. There is also another very important um, set of points, um, points where the function is equal to zero. Usually, these, point, these points very clearly um, identify the behavior of the function, and um, you will basically see that uh, the function like changes the sign, for instance, around these points, etc. Here's an example. If you, for instance, have, let me draw a new one, because this is already, if you, for instance, um, have a function which looks something like this. It's a function, actually it's a parabola, it's supposed to be a parabola because it's a polynomial of the second degree. x squared minus um, 3x plus 2, right? Now, on the graph, so these are x's, these are y's, this is 0, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1, minus 2, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2. Now, What's very important, and it really strikes the eye, that the function takes the value of 0 when x is equal to 1 or x is equal to 2. So the function is definitely, function graph is definitely crossing these two uh, points. x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 0. Same thing, x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 0. That's obvious, right? Now, secondly, Let's go to infinity. When x is very large, obviously y grows as well. And it's always positive. So function is always positive when the x is large. So here, somewhere, it looks like this. And it's increasing, obviously. On a function, when the, when the argument is negative, same thing happens here. 
because uh, it will be negative and this will be negative and negative times negative will be positive so function is positive again and its absolute value will grow as well if absolute value of the x grows so somewhere here is also growing if x goes to minus infinity y goes to plus infinity now what we have here is the following function is positive here and positive here these are the only two points where the function is equal to zero so obviously your conclusion is that the function goes something like this and changes the sign when it crosses its, uh, its root, actually, when the function is equal to zero. So qualitatively, the function should look like that. Well, yes, we know that this is a parabola and basically more, it's probably more like this, more smooth, etc. But that's the detail. Um, the uh, general behavior of the function is basically like this. It goes to infinity on both sides. One and two are two roots, so it changes the sign. When it crosses this, crosses the point x equals one, it changes the value from positive to negative. Same thing here. So that's just one of the very important characteristics of the function, where, when exactly it takes um, the value of zero. Another very important characteristic is uh, functions can be odd or even. Now, odd function is the function which changes the sign when argument changes the sign. Example, y equals 3x. If x positive, that's a positive value. If, if x is changing to a negative sign, let's say from 5 to minus 5, then the function will change from um, 15 to minus 15. What does it mean graphically? Very simple. If this is one of the points on the graph, let's say 1 and 3. So x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 3. Obviously it belongs to the graph. So, I know that if x equals 1, y equals to 3 belongs to the graph, then if I change the sign, both, x and y, and it will be the same but on the negative side, so minus 1, minus 3, minus 1, minus 3, will always be on the graph as well. So, together with 1 point, 1, 3, we have minus 1, minus 3. What does it mean? It means it's centrally symmetric. Let's take another example. y equals to x cubed. If x changes the sign, y changes the sign as well. And in exactly the same, uh, and, and, and the absolute value will be exactly the same because 2 to the third degree to the power of 3 will be 8, minus 2 to the third degree will be 3 times uh, uh, multiplied by itself, it will be minus 8. So again, on my graph, if my point 2, 8 belongs to the graph, my point minus 2, minus 8 belongs to the graph, right? So again, it's centrally symmetric. So all the points, which means that the whole graph will be centrally symmetric, which means if we will turn it by 180 degrees, it will basically um, um, coincide with itself. And by the way, the graphic of this thing uh, would be something like this. very symmet centrally symmetrical. If you turn it 180 degrees, it will coincide with itself. One of the consequences of the function being odd is that obviously point zero, 0, also belongs to the graph. Every odd function crosses the zero, 0. So, official um, definition of the odd function is the following. 
f of minus x is equal to minus f of, of x. So a function, this function. If I will take x cube minus x cube, this is function of minus x. Obviously, this is minus x minus x minus x equals to minus 1 to the third degree and x to the third degree, which is minus 1 times x minus x cubed. I know, that's kind of trivial. I probably should <laughs> write it uh, in one line rather than uh, three. But anyway, this is kind of an obvious uh, quality of one of uh, odd functions, the x cubed. But this is the general characteristic. If you substitute minus x for x into the formula, then basically you can um, uh, have the same value, uh, the same absolute value as if x would be um, used, but then uh, it's supposed to be uh, a, a negative sign should, should, should be applied. Now, with the even function, let me start from a definition, then we'll go to examples. That's the function which does not change the sign if you change um, the sign of the argument. Example. Obvious example is classical parabola. <coughs> if you change the sign from x, you put minus x. Minus x squared will be exactly the same thing as x squared. Now, What's interesting about um, even functions from the graphical uh, standpoint? Again, odd functions are centrally symmetrical, so you can turn the whole plane by 180 degrees, it will coincide with itself. Even functions are symmetrical relative to the vertical y-axis. Why is that? Because if a, b, a point a, b, let me just put it in new coordinate plane. This is point AB, which means B is equal to F of A, right? So this point belongs to the graph, it means this. Now, since the function is even, if I change the sign of the argument, it will get exactly the same function. So, what, what actually follows from it, that the point minus a, b, belongs to the graph. Now, if this is a, b, this is minus a, b. So, from, for, for each point, uh, there is another one, which is just a mirror image relative to the y-axis, which also belongs to the graph. So, for even functions, we can always say that they are centrally symmetrical, and you see, probably centrally symmetrical. Another example can be x squared plus 1. It's also a parabola, and it doesn't really cross zero. Crossing zero is only for odd functions, because they're centrally symmetrical. Um, even functions don't have to cross zero, obviously, but they are supposed to be centrally symmetrical. So in the case of x squared plus 1, it will be almost the same thing, but shifted up by 1, uh, by the unity, virtually. Okay, so these are odd and even functions. Now, why is it important to differentiate all the functions um, in certain categories? Well, because we know certain properties, and sometimes it's easier to do uh, uh, graphs for something more elementary and then construct it in a more complete fashion. For instance, if I know how a function behaves for positive argument x, and I know that the function is, uh, let's say, even, I don't really have to think about how it behaves on the negative side. I can just symmetrically uh, draw another piece. Similarly, if you remember, in the beginning, I was talking about function y. 
y equals to 1 over x. And in the beginning, again, we said that it approaches infinity on the positive side and uh, when, when x is approaching 0. And it's approaching 0 when x is approaching infinity on the positive side. I don't even have to think about what's happening on the negative side, because obviously this function is odd. Because if I will take a function of minus x, which is 1 over minus x, it's equal to 1 over x, with a minus in front of it. Oh, oh, let me just do this way. Minus 1 over x, which is f of, uh, x with a minus sign. So f at minus x is equal to minus f at x, which is the definition of the odd function. So the function is centrally symmetrical. I mean, the graph is centrally symmetrical. So I can just turn the whole thing on 180 degree, and I get this piece. But I don't even have to think about this, because I know that it's a centrally symmetrical graph. So it helps. Now, if you have a um, certain graph, you can actually manipulate with this graph using some very elementary techniques. Example, let's say you have a function f of x. And now you would like to know what happens if instead of x you would put x minus a. What happens with the graph? Because sometimes function looks like this. But you know the function which uh, and graphical representation of this function. Example, y is equal to x minus 1. Well, you know when the f of x is 1 over x, you know the graph of this function. And you have to draw this function. Well, I mean, immediately, it's not really easy. And uh, you can obviously start by thinking, aha, uh -huh, this function is not defined when x is equal to 1. So 1 is a special point in exactly the same way as for this function, 0 was a special point. But we have, a, <coughs> we have already made all our studying uh, research of this particular graph. Can we use it to grab this function without thinking much? Yes, we can. And here's how. <coughs> well, let's assume that you have a point on the graph which is one of the uh, pairs uh, which satisfy this particular equation. Let's say you have something like um, capital B is equal to F of capital A. Which means function has a graph with A, B on it. Now, here is an interesting point. If you will substitute for this function, if you will substitute instead of x, you will put a plus lowercase a. What would be the value? Uh, what would be the value of y in this particular case? Well, it will be f of a plus a minus a which is f of a. But we know this is b, right? We have started from this graph. So what's interesting is that if argument is equal to this, then the function is equal to this. Which means the point a plus lowercase a comma b belongs to the new graph. So if a, B belongs to the old graph, then A plus A, B belongs to the new graph. Now, where is A plus A? It's this. 